Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, August 7th, 2021. And our top story today, the Nebraska legislature passes a financial literacy bill. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is the Honorable John Moranti, the Nebraska State Treasurer. John, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, let's, uh, we're going to talk about financial literacy today, and I know you and uh, your fellow colleagues in the state, in the, in the legislature, recently passed LB452, which is a financial literacy bill. I want to get your perspective on this. Why is this so meaningful and important for Nebraskans? Sure, it's critically important, and what the, the bill says is that every kid who graduates from high school in the state of Nebraska will be taught a curriculum in personal finance and financial literacy, and that school uh, districts will integrate uh, personal finance and financial literacy into the elementary and uh, middle school level. So uh, from start to finish, our kids will be uh, receiving this uh, critical education. And I, I think this is one of the most important things that the state ought to be teaching in public schools uh, and private schools for that matter to, to, to every kid, because there are lessons that will be used throughout our lives. And especially as kids go off to college, they're in high school, they're having conversations about you know, what jobs, what careers do they want? What, what sort of education does it require uh, to have that sort of a career? Do they need to go uh, to a four-year university or is a community college or a trade school more in line? And how do, you, how do all of those decisions uh, deal with student loan debt and the uh, the, the sort of impact on your life, the tag, taking out massive amounts of student loan debt will have 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Uh, having these conversations at the K-12 12 level, I think, puts Nebraska kids uh, a, a step ahead. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think this when you look at what's happening around our country, I know even at the federal level, this is a big focus. But all your, your colleagues across in other great state treasurers across this country really focusing on this. What has been the, uh, how has this bill, been, you know, obviously there's a lot going on in the legislature every year on very important issues. Uh, what has been the reception that this bill has received from your fellow Nebraskans? So uh, I'll answer that a couple of ways. First, sure. uh, the most common response I get is how, how has this not happened before? How this, this seems like such common sense. How are we not teaching our kids to do this? And a lot of school districts in Nebraska are already doing it. So uh, to, to make sure that every kid graduates on a level playing field, uh, I think is a great thing for our kids. Uh, but many of us who have been, who have prioritized uh, financial literacy have been trying to get this over the finish line for years in Nebraska. Uh, and we've met a, a lot of opposition and it was really credit. It is a credit to the leadership of uh, State Senator Terrell McKinney from Omaha, State Senator Julie Slama from Southeast Nebraska, who's a conservative Republican. These are two people who are ideologically very, very different from very, very different parts of the state, but who came together in a bipartisan way to get this bill over the finish line. It passed unanimously and was signed by uh, Governor Ricketts. So the people of Nebraska, I think, feel, feel it's common sense, but it's really the leadership of Senators uh, Slama and McKinney that got it over the finish line this year. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I couldn't think of a more bipartisan topic. I mean, I'm sure there are, are others, but retirement savings, being you know, financially secure and independent are, seem to be at the top of, of my mind. But then again, who knows? What are, what are, some, of the, what are some of the next steps in terms of uh, implementation and getting, is this effective with the fall curriculum um, it, you know, for, for children going to school? And I say children because they may be 18 years or younger. Sure. Uh, uh, and I'm very far from that. I've graduated college and high school a long time ago. But what are some of the next steps that you, you plan to see um, at, it, within schools? So uh, as I mentioned, school districts uh, across the state have already started integrating this sort of curriculum into uh, their, their studies. And I think that's a great thing. I suspect that with uh, the bill becoming operative, we'll see more and more school districts accelerating to provide more resources to uh, kids on this subject matter before final implementation in 2023. Um, but I, I can't stress enough, both in the state of Nebraska and our state treasurer's office and at state treasurer's offices across the country, we prioritize financial literacy. We understand the importance of uh, having a financially literate 
uh, constituency. And many of our offices have free resources on our website that we're already providing. Nebraska Treasurer's Office is already providing free resources in the form of an EverFi software system where we're in hundreds of schools teaching thousands of kids already uh, the importance of personal, uh, personal finance, partnering with great organizations like the Nebraska Bankers Association, uh, the University of Nebraska to have banks within schools where students run their own banks and can kind of see how that process uh, operates uh, in a real meaningful basis. And even down the road, we consider uh, financial literacy to be part of our college savings program, that, that our 529 program, which is, in my opinion, one of the best in the country and consistently ranked one of the best in the country, uh, we try and get into schools to teach kids that Saving, you know, it's never too early, it's never too late, and there's no amount that's too little to make a meaningful difference. There is uh, a statistic that's often cited that kids who have between $1 and $500 in uh, college savings, so $500 in the grand scheme of a four-year uh, degree doesn't take you very far, but kids who even have that little amount of college savings are four times more likely to go to college and five times more likely to graduate from college and getting kids on a college-bound identity, having conversations with their parents uh, and their teachers and their schools about what the best form of education to accomplish their career path, I, th I think it's all a wonderful thing. Yeah, I guess last question here, uh, Treasure. I agree with you, by the way. Uh, Treasure, last question here. You know, we talk a lot about cyber hygiene, uh, general hygiene, whether it's brushing your teeth. And it seemed to me that financial hygiene is important, whether you're in K through 12, higher education, if you choose to go to that direction or a vocational school. But what about, will there be some plans maybe in the future that under consideration about continuing education for, for people like myself who are just going through life and maybe buying that house for the first time and, and, and need to brush up on some skills, financial skills? Uh, every year we look for opportunities uh, to provide financial literacy resources across the spectrum because you're absolutely right. This isn't curriculum that's, uh, we, we can teach in 12th grade and then it becomes obsolete. It, there are decisions that we have to make throughout, should you start a Roth IRA? Is that the right retirement vehicle? How to plan for retirement? What about estate planning? Especially if uh, for those of us who have dealt with elderly parents and grandparents, uh, we observe elder abuse. That's a, it's an increasingly interesting topic and important topic in financial literacy. And we work with attorneys general from across the country to make sure that uh, the elderly are protected and their finances are protected when their um, uh, finances are in the custody of somebody else. So absolutely. And, and we just had a webinar series, uh, a six-part webinar series that we partnered with the Nebraska Council on Economic Education and funded by Wells Fargo Bank for all uh, public employees uh, across the state of Nebraska. And so those, that is currently on our website free of charge for anyone who wants to see a wide array of whether it's saving for your kid's college education, the difference between good and bad debt, how to get out of debt, good tools and resources for budget management uh, and, and the like. Uh, absolutely, it's curriculum that we think, uh, we try to provide as many resources uh, across, the, uh, across the spectrum. Yeah, the treasurer, I mean, congratulations to you. You know, I always questioned why, why I needed to know the Battle of Hastings was in 1066, but I can definitely <laughs> tell you that these attributes, these are foundational principles that follow you for the rest of your life. And I'm so happy to speak with you and learn about what you are doing for Nebraskans in the great state of Nebraska. Treasurer John Moranti, great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you and your team back on the program again very soon. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Great to see you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. And when we come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. 
But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and called Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. On Wednesday, I sat down with the Pew Charitable Trust's John Scott to discuss how auto IRA programs complement the retirement plan at private markets. Let's take a look. I think the data does show even our own research and, and others um, are fairly consistent. So um, a number of different types of workers. So younger workers tend not to have retirement benefits relative to older workers. And that makes sense because they're often starting out in their careers. They're taking you know, the first jobs, may not have a lot of choices that involve uh, benefit packages. So younger workers, generally um, people of color, uh, especially Hispanics, don't have access to a retirement plan. Um, certain industries, workers in certain industries, such as the hospitality industry or the construction industry, uh, they tend not to have retirement benefits within that industry. So employers within that uh, segment, you know, they don't feel the competitive pressure to offer uh, benefits. Um, and then workers at small firms, um, we know that smaller employers are less likely to have retirement benefits than and larger firms, and, and there's some uh, correlation amongst those factors. So we know, for example, that Hispanic workers tend to be overrepresented in the construction industry. So, you know, all those demographic factors tend to, to interact to some degree. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a long and winding road. I mean, I think it really starts with some research that occurred, you know, 15, 20 years ago that looked into using, you know, what we now call defaults, like automatic enrollment, those have been widely adopted by larger corporate plan sponsors, but they haven't really filtered down to the smaller uh, employers. And, and of course, as we just talked about, there are a lot of workers that aren't covered by these plans. So there was some legislation introduced, you know, roughly 10 years ago at the beginning of the Obama administration that proposed a national auto IRA program. That didn't go any, anywhere uh, because of some of the divisiveness in Congress. So the state saw an opportunity, in particular California was the first to pass legislation in 2012. Um, and they really felt this was an opportunity to address what they felt was a sort of a crisis within their own populations that you know, people were not prepared for retirement and they would be essentially a burden on state finances. Uh, there are nine states that have passed legislation there are three states out of those nine, uh, California, Illinois, and Oregon, that have been actively enrolling workers and uh, saving. So we have nine states, um, three of whom are up and running, and then six states are, are in various stages of implementation. Well, I, I think there are a lot of different ways to, to think about this. So let me just throw out a couple of different perspectives with some numbers. I mean, in terms of the assets, you know, I think across the three operating states, you know, we're at, you know, approximately $250 million plus, so a quarter of a billion dollars and more. That's up 60% since the, the start of the year. We're approaching 400,000 participants in, in these programs, again, across the, the three states. Um, we have 
you know, a participation rate of roughly 68 to 70 percent, um, which is a, which is a pretty good response for a you know basically a bare bones uh, savings program. Our own research has shown that employers are tend to be satisfied with this program. We did a survey of small business owners in Oregon; they're generally satisfied with the program, not showing any burdens or out of pocket costs. You know, just one little qualitative note: one employer wrote in our survey. Uh, that this really enables them to compete with uh, larger companies that have a 401k and a, and a full range of benefits. So I, I think the impact can be seen, you know, both in terms of the individual level, you know, uh, can, people are saving roughly $100 a month and building up a little uh, nest egg. You know, it's, it's helping the states in terms of, you know, a looming aging crisis and a fiscal impact. And it's helping small businesses uh, get to a more level playing field by being able to offer a benefits package. This is a fairly new social innovation. You know, you're enrolling an entire state population in a savings program. How would that impact employers and the market for retirement plans? Um, so our concern was this issue of, of crowd out. What we've seen is that, in fact, the state programs are complementary uh, to the private market for retirement plans. Uh, we looked at um, Form 5500 data going back to 2013, analyzed that by state, looking for growth rates in each of the states. And what we're seeing is uh, states like Oregon and Illinois and California, they're either at the national average for new plan growth or they're above it. And in fact, Oregon in 2019 had the second highest rate of growth in new plans in the country. So what that tells us is that uh, rather than crowding out or competing with private plan providers, the state programs are actually complementary to our existing employer-based system. And I also spoke with the hearing and speech agency's Dr. Julie Norn about detecting and preventing hearing loss. Let's take a look. So hearing loss is actually the third most common chronic condition in the United States. So it's more prevalent than diabetes and more prevalent than even cancer, which it sounds daunting, but what that breaks down to is over 50 million people in the US suffer from some degree or some type of hearing loss. But I think what your viewers would probably find more relevant to them is that one out of every three people at the age of 65 have some sort of hearing loss. And that number actually increases to two out of every three people between the ages of 70 and 79. And for those who are 85 years and older, 80% are suffering from some form of hearing loss that is actually severe enough to affect their daily communication. So there, there's been lots of studies on aging and hearing loss and a study out of uh, the, uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine actually indicated that for every 10 year increase in age, the uh, prevalence of hearing loss actually doubles. So usually when we think about hearing loss, we think of it in terms of aging because in society, we're just accustomed to seeing people in the older population are the ones with hearing loss, but hearing loss can actually occur at any age. The majority of people that we tend to see in my practice and tend to see um, just in general are usually people who develop hearing loss over time. So that could be due to aging or that can be due to a history of some type of noise exposure. So usually occupational. So either working in a factory or working with machine noise or power tools or those who are in the military. Uh, but we do see a small number of children who are born with hearing loss. So it's, it's estimated that about 3% of children who are born are born with some form of hearing loss. And sometimes that can be medically treated or sometimes that's permanent. But the majority of those who suffer from hearing loss are certainly those who are in the aging population. There are lots of sounds in our environment that can contribute to our hearing loss that we don't really think about because they're sounds that we're accustomed to. And that can include something like a hairdryer or a vacuum cleaner, a lawnmower or a leaf blower, um, everyday power tools that we use around the house, like a small drill, um, certainly firearms and motorcycles. So all of those environmental sounds have decibel levels that are at 90 decibels or higher, which is considered a, a dangerous decibel level for loudness. 
but some sounds that you might not really think about include things like your garbage disposal, um, earphones or AirPods, which a lot of people are using more, more often now, public sporting events like an NFL football game, those stadiums get incredibly loud. And in fact, there's, there's um, clout now for stadiums that can get their decibel level up as loud as possible during a yeah. game, um, which, you know, we haven't seen that in the last year and a half, but we're likely to see that moving forward. Um, and also something like an ambulance siren passing by. But again, even though those are considered high risk sounds, uh, we do have some safety measures. So a high risk sound, something that, like I mentioned, which would be about 90 decibels, your safe exposure time is actually eight hours. So, you know, are you going to be exposed to something like a garbage disposal for eight consecutive hours? <laughs> Hopefully not, not. Likely, but what's important to keep in mind is that for every five decibel of increase, in loudness, your safe exposure time is cut by 50%. Yeah. So if a 90 decibel sound has a safe exposure time of eight hours, once that sound reaches 95 decibels, your safe exposure time reduces to four hours and yeah. so on. So it's really important to, to protect your hearing, even when you're exposed to something that you might think is at a safe level, either using um, foam earplugs or custom fit earplugs or earmuffs, just making sure that those devices are properly fit so that you're really protecting your hearing. A hearing loss is actually something that usually will happen slowly over time. So we tend to start doing things to compensate for things that we're not hearing, like leaning in, reading facial expressions, um, you know, asking people to repeat themselves. And these things that we do become second nature and we might not even realize we're doing them. So usually other people tend to notice when you're having difficulty with your hearing before you would notice it yourself. But certainly some sounds that you might start to have difficulty hearing and that you might notice would be um, things like the blinker in your car, birds chirping, water dripping. Um, you might start to experience difficulty understanding women's and children's voices or conversations in the presence of noise. And that's because they, these are all sounds that tend to be a higher frequency sound. And we tend to lose our ability to hear the higher frequencies first. So um, I would say most people would start to realize that they're having difficulty hearing um, their spouse or grandchildren, or they're having difficulty hearing over the phone. Um, so those would be good indicators that you might be having, uh, might be starting to lose your hearing. One other yeah. thing to keep in mind is that um, there have been studies that show that about 90% of people who experience tinnitus also pronounced tinnitus, but on a basic level, ringing in the ears or chirping in the ears, 90% of people who have that experience also have some form of hearing loss. So that would be a really key indicator. So if you're experiencing any kind of tinnitus, um, that would be a good indicator that you may have a hearing loss. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, Drop us a line and don't forget for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more. Check out today's edition of the Morning Pulse. We're back again tomorrow, this time for BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media, academia and financial services as we analyze all the news for the week in so many different topics. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited and do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. 
The tax doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a tax doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.